Yep, we're right. Cool. Uh, our next presenter is Anne Jessel, who has a presentation on what lies beneath, what are they really tracking, and how. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And well, I'm very grateful for you to come in. Well, I didn't expect this many people, so thank you. All right. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is what happens to your privacy when you visit a website, or at least what we can find out about it. I'm sure most of you know it's a bit difficult to find out everything, but let's just see how far we can go. First of all, a little bit about me. I'm from Melbourne. These days, I do lots of things. I've done lots of things in the past. The bits that are relevant here, I'm a tech person who for many years has mixed with non-business, or non, sorry, non-technical business owners. So I've dealt quite a lot with non-tech people and trying to explain to them. It's called email or web. Yes, is it HTTP or HTTPS? Yeah, anyway. Last few years, I've been dealing a lot with the technical side of website optimization, and I've been mixing a lot with marketers and SEO people and so on. Now, before I got into that area, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what they were all collecting about us and everything, and then I started mixing with them, finding out what they were actually doing. I was being asked to collect some stuff. I uh, went to conferences and talks, and I was continually surprised by how little I thought they'd been collecting compared to what they actually do. So that's why I thought I'd present this talk to give you an idea of the sorts of things that are happening. What I'm going to talk about is, first of all, who collects what data and why, how it can be collected. Then I'm going to look at a case study where I picked a website, well-known Australian website that many of you should have at least heard of if you're in Australia or if not heard of, maybe even used. And then I'm going to finish off with some thoughts about what sorts of things you can do about it. In this talk, I'm talking about web data only. There are other ways they gather data. I'm mostly not talking about that except for one or two specific points that I'll mention. Firstly, why collect the data? Well, the two primary reasons are for advertising and for market research. The advertising data, or the data for advertising, um, that can be correct, collected directly, so that your Facebooks, your Googles, Microsofts, who run some sort of advertising platform, so they collect the data about you, so that they can sell advertising to people who want to advertise in order to target you. There's also third parties that collect the similar sort of data, and they sell that data to people who want to advertise. Now, the primary reason they give is so that you can see ads that are of actual interest to you instead of boring ones. Frankly, I haven't seen much evidence of that actually working. <laughs> um, I tend to see ads for things I've bought last week or things that are competitors to what I bought last week. And there seems to be a distinct lack of ads about things I didn't know existed but would really love to buy if I did know they existed. Another thing with advertising isn't just ads of interest, but it's also to do with nudging. Now, for those of you who went to Dr. Sean Brady's keynote on Tuesday where he talked about priming, priming is one form of nudging. Nudging is where there is some little thing that just pushes you in a certain direction subtly without you knowing. If you think you're immune, well, I think um, Dr Brady helped me out there. For those of you who are there, I think you're convinced that most people aren't immune. In fact, there's lots of research that shows if you're immune, you're probably not human. <laughs> um, you may be less immune than the person sitting next to you, perhaps, but you're not going to be totally immune. The other reason is market research, as I said, and you're probably familiar with market researchers and the sorts of reports and information they publish. So that's the other reason that the information's collected. OK, how do we discover what information they collect? Well, there's what they admit to. There's small print in their privacy policies, terms and conditions and whatever. 
And when you're talking about the web, you can investigate the actual traffic and try and see what's going on. It's not always easy to find out. I have sometimes been su surprised by the, what they admit to. And I found when they admit to something that I'm standing there going, you what? It's usually because they do not see any issues with what they're collecting, so they're happy to admit to it. I've been to a few talks where I've thought, hmm, um, you may or may not have be aware that banks these days are analysing your credit card transactions and selling the insights they gain from that data. They don't see any concerns with that. What, why could anyone worry about that? Um, there's lots of other areas in which data's covered, uh, gathered as well that might surprise you. Uh, if you want to talk to me at some time about some of the stuff that uh, the Westfield shopping centres, and I'm sure they're not the only ones, gather. Um, I was shocked when I heard some of that stuff. Um, they've even got heat sensors on the doors, so they know how many... Anyway, that's, we're talking about the web. Now, in this thing for the privacy policies, the GDPR that came in in May 2018 is pretty wonderful. Hands up anyone who doesn't have any idea what the GDPR is. A couple of people. Okay, the EU, as in the European Union, I love them, they're fantastic, the things they've brought in. One of the things they brought in is the GDPR, or the General Data Protection Regulation. And basically, that means that if you're dealing with European citizens, they don't have to be in Europe, as my understanding, if you're dealing with European citizens, you have to meet a whole pile of requirements about being honest about what you're collecting, giving the option to opt out, opt out uh, deleting their data if they ask, and a whole pile of other stuff. That has caused a big change in all the small print, and it is now a lot easier to find out what people are collecting than it used to be. It's still not as easy as I'd like it to be, but it is a lot easier. All right, how are they collecting this data? Well, the two primary ways when you're talking about the web are what I call server-side and JavaScript. Now, in this, I'm assuming a typical modern web browser without any privacy protecting add-ons or anything like that. On the server side, it's basically what your browser sends to the server. That's things like, these days they're pretty innocuous, they didn't used to seem innocuous. Things like your IP address, what, um, what web page you're visiting, what your last web page was, date and time, things about your browser and your operating system. Just don't forget, though, say you're dealing with an e-commerce site, they also know on the server what you've purchased, when you purchased it, your name, address, your email, and things like that. That's also stored on the server if you've ever typed it in. The server-side data may be shared with, for example, Facebook. I'll come back to that a bit later. Now, the JavaScript, that's the most common one, and that's what I'm going to be concentrating on in this talk. The JavaScript, that's the JavaScript code that runs inside your web browser, gathers stuff while running in your web browser and sends it off to somewhere for some purpose. Just as an aside, these technologies, or the JavaScript in particular, and some others, can be used to collect data in email as well, including cross-device. So, for example, you open an email on your phone, you then open the same email on your desktop system. Now, whoever's collecting the data from that email knows that that phone and that desktop system are both yours. So they can join you up as one user, even though you're using two different devices. Just, just one of many things. OK, what type of data might be collected? I've mentioned some of this already, um, including the previous web page you were looking at. Potentially, they could gather your name, your contact details, what items you've purchased, what other websites you visited, your location. By default, they usually get your location from your IP address. That's, in my experience, pretty useless inside the Australia. However, I've been told it is highly specific in the US. I don't have direct experience, but that's what they tell me. However, they may use your GPS or something if you've actually clicked the permission. They might collect what language you speak. Let's say you've filled in surveys, competition, maybe you've purchased something where you require to give your age or something. 
So they could match that data up with your age, your income, your ethnicity, possibly. If you connect a social media account, um, log on with Facebook, for example, then potentially they can also get your name, your email address, your picture, your followers, your friends, your tweets, your posts, your status, your likes, and anything else you can think of that has been entered in your social media accounts. From all that information, including the list of websites you visited, they can make assumptions about you, such as your religion, your sexual preferences, your interests. This isn't theoretical. They can do it. A few years ago, I became aware of a site whose name I've forgotten at the moment, where if you told them about your Facebook account, they could then tell you a whole lot about what they could glean, and that was just from your, fa your public Facebook account. All right, how do they track this? Now, when I originally submitted the proposal for this talk, I was going to do a fair bit on Facebook tracking. They've changed it. So I'm not going to go into much detail because they've changed it. They seem to have responded to criticism or something. They had quite <laughs> in-depth details about how to collect this, that and the other for the developers to use. They've cut that way back and it's nowhere near as scary as it was. Let me just give you a brief review of what it was just a few months ago because anyone who's installed this who didn't know better uh, up until recently would probably have followed these instructions. Okay. You go in, you want to do advertising on Facebook. So Facebook says, well, you need to install the Facebook pixel on your website. And you say, ah, oh, OK, how do I do that? Click, click, click. Facebook says, you can auto-install if you use one of these things on your website. First time I came across this, the, one of the options was Google Tag Manager, which, for those who don't know, is a free service offered by Google, which is actually very useful for helping to manage some of the JavaScript snippets you put on your website. You can look it up if you're interested in more than that. Facebook very thoughtfully says, or used to say, ah, if you're using Google Tag Manager, we can set it all up for you. All you need to do is give us your credentials for logging into Google Tag Manager. <laughs> I kind of said, nope. I mean, remembering that it's your Google account. It's not just your Google Tag Manager credentials you're giving them. You're giving them your Google Mail, your Docs, your, yeah. But Many people do, and I know for a fact that some people are a bit blasé. Anyway, if you did hand that out, Facebook would then go and install all the JavaScript. As part of that installing the JavaScript, or if you decide to do it manually, they give you a checkbox, advanced matching. It's turned on, or it used to be, and, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, you're installing this stuff. Facebook says, do you want advanced matching? It's defaulted to on, so of course you'd say no, wouldn't you? Well, everyone here might, but plenty others wouldn't. Okay, so you come across that and you think, I'm not sure about this, I want to know a bit more. So you go and find out the documentation, and I've extracted a bit from the documentation there, describing what advanced matching is. It can report on more, con uh, more conversions, optimise your ads, reach more people. Well, you know, if you're doing Facebook ads, you're not going to want that. Okay. Of course you will. If you dig further, you find out what it does. What it does, depending on whether your website is one that Facebook can deal with, for example, whether it's a WordPress or whatever, they can potentially gather this information from your visitors. You'll notice things like email address and name, gender, date of birth. So they can actually collect that from the website if the website has that information available, obviously. Now, just before you start thinking Facebook is evil, they're not. Well, they are, they are, okay. But this is all documented. If you dig into the documentation, you can find out what they're doing. Unlike many others, Google is often lumped in the same category as Facebook. In my opinion, they're nowhere near as bad Google categorically state in their terms and conditions that you must not 
provide personally identifiable information like this into things like Google Analytics. So just keep in mind, in the stuff I'm covering, Google's a very good guy and Facebook's a reasonably good guy. We'll look at some others soon. <laughs> Okay, first of all aside, is it only enterprises that are collecting this data? No. Okay, I've got up there what they collect. Enterprises are likely to collect data. They are likely to send it to multiple third parties. And they're also likely to describe the fact that they're doing so in privacy policy or similar document. Contrast that with small businesses. They'll collect the data, they'll send to multiple third parties, but they won't tell you in the privacy policy. Why not? Well, let me give you an example. There is a fairly well-known social button plugin called Add This. Hands up if you've heard of it. Well, less people than I expected. Okay, keep your hand up if you've been involved in creating a website that uses it. Is that an, oh, one or two maybe? Okay, did, keep your hand up if you read the terms and conditions that go with Add This and told the website owner that they needed to update their privacy policy accordingly. Okay, I have no hands up now, which doesn't surprise me because that's normal. The bit that surprised me is how few people put up their hands that they've used it. As I said, it's a social button plugin. It's been around for years. What it does is you install it on a website and it automatically puts up, you know, the like this on Facebook, share this on Instagram, you know, all those sorts of little buttons in the nice little thing that we all see on lots of websites. It's free, it's easy to install, it's flexible and it has many features. It's quite popular for people to install it, for web designers to install it. When I first came across Add This, I tried to dig in to find out what it was actually doing because it was doing stuff, it was sending data and I didn't know what was going on. I could work out from their privacy policy that they were gathering data and they were doing something with it. And aside from that, I was having a bit of trouble. More recently, Add This has been bought by Oracle. This is actually a good thing because Oracle has actually updated all the privacy policies and everything, and now you can learn a bit about what it does. So that's always a plus. Um, we all know, you know, everyone's going to check the privacy policies, but I'm one of these weird people that at least sometimes does. Okay, what does it collect? Now, I'm leaving out from this and others that I talk about further in the talk, I am leaving out that they collect your IP and that they collect the website. I'm leaving out all that sort of stuff that just comes naturally with being on the web. This is the extra stuff that you might not immediately think of. So, add this collects the presence or use of apps. I wasn't quite clear what that means. I'm assuming that's on a mobile device. Date and time, the search you use to get there. They associate personal information about you with interest segments or profiles. Okay. They collect Oh, they're really helpful because on behalf of the publisher, they will collect email addresses. That's to help the publisher create email lists. However, they're not responsible for what the publisher does with those email lists. Just, just. They may, now they word this funnily, incorporate cookies and pixels, you can read it. Basically what they're saying is they've got a bunch of partners and they may incorporate on websites that use the Add This plugin and identifies for their partners so that all these other companies can agree on who you are. They do list the 40 plus partners. Feel free to have a look sometime. The ones you've probably heard of include Adobe, eBay and Google. Okay. Now, let's move on to a case study. This is a screen grab from my target site a couple of weeks ago. News.com.au. Anyone here have no idea who news.com.au is? One hand a bit wobbly. Yep. If you're not Australian, you probably haven't heard of them. They're, uh, how do I put it, a major news source in Australia. They own a lot of the main newspapers and lots of other media. In other words, a large portion of the Australian population get their news from news.com.au or one of their brands. 
When I chose them, I was actually looking for a well-known Australian site that wasn't actually a marketing site as such. Yeah, they've got ads, but, you know, news media does have ads. Quite often we're used to that. I wondered whether I would have to not continue with this and find another one. I didn't have to find another one. I had no idea what I'd find. All right, briefly, tools I used. The primary three were way, way, ah, webpagetest.org, gtmetrics.com, and my Chrome developer tools. Those first two overlap a lot in the information they can gather, but they present different parts in different ways, so I find it useful for both of them. First thing I did was I had a look at what domains that web page got my browser to access when I loaded it. Now, I want to stress, I opened up my web browser, I typed in news.com.au and I pressed enter. I didn't scroll, I didn't click, I didn't log in, I didn't do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> I tried fitting all those domains on the screen and I thought, no, that's a bit much. I don't expect you to read that, by the way. There is a more dot, dot, dot in the bottom in case you can't see that. However, it's not really quite as bad as it looks. For example, you've got www.news.com.au and tags.news.com.au. That's not too surprising. You know, if you go to news.com.au and you get two or three subdomains, it doesn't seem like a bad idea. So I squashed all them up so that I ended up with just the root domains. I can fit it on one screen now. It's still not fair, though, because some of those are CDNs or there's an API, a news API domain in there and things like that. So I thought, OK, let's cross those out and leave only the ones that are marketing or analytics platforms. <laughs> We've got less. OK, that many. I didn't expect that many. I knew I'd get a few, but I thought I might get half of that number. All right, so what are they collecting? What are they sending? First thing I tried looking at is what data are they sending? Uh, I should mention this includes a mixture of analytics, so such as Google Analytics and Chartbeat, advertising platforms such as Google Ad Services, and data collectors such as Scorecard Research. All right, what is the data that's sent? I found that some of these domains are setting up to 27 cookies per domain. Most of the data that's sent is encrypted or hashed or something. So I've got two examples here. Critio.com is an advertising platform. That is the data they sent. It's encrypted or hashed or whatever. I don't know what that is. Another one is taboola.com. They do content discovery and native advertising, whatever that actually means. They've got a mixture of stuff I can't understand and stuff that is understandable. Uh, they've got a lot more. I've cut it off because it didn't all fit. The stuff that is understandable, I was curious to find, seems to reflect mostly timing data. How long did it take to load? How long did it take to render? That sort of stuff. Not really relevant for what I was looking for, but I thought that was curious. They're happy to put that in plain text. OK, we're not going to get much by looking at the data sent. So let's try the privacy policy. Once again, I'm leaving out the fact that they collect your IP address and everything. They collect for their subscribers name, address, OK, birth date and gender. I don't know why they need that for their subscribers, but they collect it. They say that, oh, and by the way, most of this is cut and paste directly from their privacy policy. So if you see spelling errors or anything, it's not me. They will include certain third parties such as Facebook, which may also collect information. They may supplement the information from other sources. They may collect your browsing activity on and off their network of digital properties. So they'll collect data from sites other than news.com.au sites. And they've got a whole pile of other domains as well, like Herald Sun in Melbourne and so on. They will also use these technologies in emails or newsletters they send you and on third-party websites. 
they will supplement this information from data collected from other trusted businesses with whom you have a relationship. They will share that data with their company affiliates, with business partners if you've agreed. That one gets me. They'll share it with anyone and everyone except they'll only share it with business partners if you agree, but otherwise, you know. Anyway, they may also use it for a bunch of things, and I've just picked out a few, data matching, campaign analysis, consumer insights, and so on. They do have an opt-out. But if you decide to opt out, you might be, want to check what you're opting out of. Basically, if you opt out, you're opting out of the target ad targeted advertising. You are not opting out of data collection. You are not opting out of any other use of your data, like sharing it with other people. It's just the actual targeted advertising you're opting out of. OK, that's news.com.au. But there are a whole bunch of other domains that the data goes to. What about them? Well, I just picked a few. Rubicon. Um, seems to be one of the better ones. They will uh, get the geolocation if you've enabled that. Their clients may w make inferences from the data collected, but they don't. Okay. I did say they're one of the better ones. I did mean it. <laughs> they have an opt-out that is actually an opt-out. If you opt-out, they will no longer collect any, device, any data from your device. What about Critio.com? They collect products you viewed, put in your shopping cart or purchased, identifiers that advertisers have assigned to you, extra data such as date of travel and price, events that happen in a physical store. So when you go in and buy something in bricks and mortar and you've got the loyalty card or they ask, oh, for uh, warranty or something, can we just have your email address or your mobile phone number? Well, that data's probably being sent to Critio and maybe others. They collect the advertising ID of your smartphone. They also collect data provided by partners, whatever that means. And each of those has their own policy. They then have this big long thing, which I'm not going to read out, but basically they're also collecting information about your shopping habits, Shops that are near you based on your geolocation information and what you've purchased in brick and mortar stores. Okay. Let's move on to IMR Worldwide, who've been collecting this data forever. Uh, they're actually Nielsen, who you may have heard of. So they're more in the market research side than the advertising side. In essence, they say, we collect data. We also get data from lots of other places about you, and we combine it all. Um, other data sources may include social media or e-commerce sites. Pubmatic, another one. We may, as well as all the other sort of stuff that you're probably getting used to by now, they also combine, merge or enhance with information from anyone else that will give them the information, basically. This information may include, I've got a dot, dot, dot next because there was a big long list of stuff, but then we get age, ethnicity, we're permitted by law, gender, precise geolocation, demographic or interest data, and things such as your hashed email address. Okay. They may also undertake ID syncing or user matching. Basically what that comes down to is they share all the data with other people and work out, oh, this person on our system looks like this, your, that person on your system, so let's combine what we have because it's all the one person. What do they do as far as multiple devices? Well, they also check and try and find whether you're using two different devices that are the same person or household so that they combine that data as well. They have an opt-out. They helpfully point out, though, that you will need to opt out separately on each of your browsers and each of your mobile devices. There are some other issues aside from that with opt out, which I'll mention later. Now, there's one more I'm going to mention out of that list on the um, news.com.au site, and that's ID5, who I'd never heard of before. I'd heard of the others. I hadn't heard of this one. They're different to all the others. 
They are focused solely on providing a shared identity solution to the digital advertising industry. So they're not gathering data for the sake of gathering data. They're making it easy for everyone else to know that you are you. And those two people are one pe person or those two people are two people as the case may be. Just a brief mention of apps, you know, on mobile phones, you know a lot of companies want you to install their app. This is why they can get an awful lot more detail out of an app than they can off the web. You can see they can potentially get your contacts, your phone number, etc, etc. The operating system does have permissions that's intended to prevent this unless you agree to it. A lot of people find those permissions a bit difficult to negotiate, so yeah. All right, risk factors. If you're going to a website, what is most likely to indicate that this, could, this sort of stuff's being collected? Okay, if you've got a non-technical business owner or website manager, there's a reasonable chance it's being collected. Or a typical web designer servicing small to medium business. That's because of the add this example I gave. And add this isn't the only one. Typical web designers and uh, business owners who are non-technical don't know this is going on. Your web designer will put in the thing that's easiest. They will use Add This because it's easy, it's free, they can get the job done and move on. They don't tell the website owner because they don't know. The website owner doesn't ask, or the business owner doesn't ask, because they don't imagine that this is possible. I've run into a lot of non-technical people who say, I'm not worried about Facebook because I'm careful what I type into it. And when I try to explain that Facebook can actually gather data that you're not typing in, if you've got a Facebook account, they can gather all websites that you've been to, they basically don't believe me. They don't think that's possible. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the highly technical website uh, developers who are implementing this. And this is something that I'm a little worried about for the future. I've talked about the JavaScript gathering the data and that server-side isn't a big deal. That's a yet. A few years ago, I knew this was possible but didn't see much sign of it happening. More recently, I'm starting to see it happening where, well, you saw all the domains that news.com.au accessed. And I could look at all those privacy policies. And if I was into blocking those things, I could block facebook.com, I could block critio.com, and they wouldn't get the data. However, I can't block news.com.au's JavaScript because then I won't be able to read the news. There is nothing to stop news.com.au gathering the data in JavaScript that is loaded from news.com.au. Send that data back to the news.com.au servers that then forward that data onto Facebook and Critio and etc. And that is starting to happen, partly because of ad blockers. Um, so at the moment, that is to my knowledge is only happening in the more highly technical website area because it takes a bit of technical expertise to do that. But I think as libraries start being developed and that's going to sort of filter down the technology level chain, so to speak. All right, what can you do about it? Well, some people use their browser in guest or incognito mode, whatever you want to call it. Hands up people who use this. Oh, I've got very bad news for you. That, for, <laughs> for those who can't see, that was more than half of the people here, probably more like three quarters. The incognito browser, and this is a often misunderstood thing, that is to protect your browsing from the next person who uses your device. It makes no difference to what is actually sent out from the browser. So if you're relying on this to protect you from the Facebooks and whoever, it's not doing one thing for that. Oh, I do, there is a small thing it is doing. When you shut it down, it deletes the cookies they've set. But frankly, if the website you've just purchased something from is sending your name and your email address and your postal address to Facebook, they don't really need a cookie. They've got your email address. That's much better. Okay. So I'm afraid the 
browser in guest or incognito modes only useful for hiding from your spouse that you are just looking up for their birthday present so they don't know what you looked for. <laughs> All right. You can opt out in the browser. Some browsers, you go into the settings, they have a thing such as do not track that you can turn on. Sounds good. It would be good if it worked. <laughs> Most sites don't honour it. Some of them are actually good enough to tell you they don't honour it. <laughs> but basically, there are so few sites that actually honour it, it's, it's essentially useless. So that's not going to work. You could block cookies. Yes, that's true, you could. Unless you block all cookies, info will leak. So if you went to the news.com.au website, you might have had Facebook blocked. You might have had Google blocked. But did you have ID5 blocked? Did you have Critio blocked? Did you have Pubmatic blocked? You probably didn't have all of them blocked. And because they're all sharing information, if you're Info gets out through one of them. If you do block all cookies, then you're going to have a bit of trouble surfing the internet. <laughs> all right, virtual private network or VPN. That can help a little bit. It offers very specific but limited protection. Now, if you didn't go to it, uh, Ruben Rubio Ray gave a talk on Tuesday about B VPNs where he did quite a good job of explaining just how much is protected. And the short answer is, for this purpose, not much. It does help a little bit, but it's really not going to help a lot. The main thing it'll do is make it more difficult for them to work out where you are. You can selectively block JavaScript and cookies, and I'm talking about here not via a plugin. I'm talking about you saying, oh, I don't want Facebook cookies and JavaScript anymore. I will drop, block all cookies and JavaScript from Facebook. Once again, that will block the well-known ones, but there are so many. It's going to be very difficult for you to curate that list and keep it up to date. It will work f as well as you can curate it. Obviously, it also won't help for that server-side collecting of data that I mentioned before that then gets forwarded on. You can opt out with the collector. So you can go to Rubicon Project, for example, and say, I opt out. That does work, possibly. It's hard work because you've got to find them all and go and opt out. As we saw before, you have to opt out on every browser, on every device you use. The other problem is it uses cookies to record the fact that you've opted out. <laughs> so the moment something happens to that cookie, it disappears for whatever reason, you are opted back in. No one ever deletes their cookies, so that should be safe. OK, a privacy protecting plugin or extension. That's some sort of ad blocker, uh, EFF's privacy badger. There's lots of them around. That's a plausible thing to go with. The question is, is the one you're using trustworthy? Does it have current coverage? Uh, I will point out some of these data collectors have been known to change their domain names over time. In fact, that list that I went to the news from the news.com.au when I was looking up, there are a couple of them that are now doing redirects to a different domain. So if you were blocking the original domain and news.com.au had updated their JavaScript so it went to the new domain, you would not be blocking it. It also, once again, won't help with those that gather the information with JavaScript and send it to the service side, which then sends it on. You could block all JavaScript. That would actually work really well, and I think that's probably the best way of avoiding this while still using the internet. However, an awful lot won't work these days. There's an awful lot of websites you will get nowhere on. OK, so far, we've got some that are OK but not great. I could only think of one that would actually work. <laughs> So yeah, that will work, just don't use the internet at all. It's true that that's not really a great option. 
Um, well, not for us who are basically addicted to using the internet. My suggestion is to research the uh, privacy protecting plugins, the ad blockers, all those. Find one that you think you trust and that seems to be curating the list of what to block well. If, in addition, it also makes it easy for you to override or add new ones when you need to. That's the best option I can suggest, I'm sorry to say. I figured someone would ask me what I did, so I added this slide. I actually go for the privacy protecting one. I use the EFF's privacy badger. They're not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, I trust the EFF. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. I can easily see what it's doing and I can easily override it. And that's why I use it. I do also use a VPN, but I'm not using that to protect me from this sort of stuff. I'm using it more to protect me when I'm on an untrusted network um, so that at least the hotel room isn't spying on what I'm doing or whatever. I will say that with a VPN, I'm, using, I'm learning a lot of American language because I keep getting those pop-up things from Google. Prove you are a human by clicking on all the pictures that have a pickup. What's a pickup? <laughs> Google, pickup. Oh, I, I know it's a vehicle. I know that the, the Americans use it to refer to a vehicle, but I don't know what sort. So, I, so I'm learning that sort of stuff by doing that. Okay. Oh, good. I'm glad I just got the five-minute warning because that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you for coming to hear my talk. I'm ready to take questions. <laughs> There's a couple up the back by the looks. On it. Yeah, great talk. Um, in addition, like you focused on the privacy protecting plugins that are effectively, um, these are the ones I want to block. There are, of course, others that take the other direction that are basically block everything unless those I'm allowing through, things like noscript.net and, and things like that, and they're the ones that I actually use because I just don't go to a lot of the sites that need heavy JavaScript, and so, you know, in that yep. case, um, that they avoid the need to have to actively curate because then you're only needing to curate the things that you want to allow through, uh, essentially. Yep. So but when, yeah. Thank so. you for mentioning that. I should probably have mentioned those ones. I forgot about them. I used to use those years ago, and then I got to the point that I was spending all my time allowing something, reloading, allowing something, reloading, and I just got sick of it. Yeah, it, de so. it depends very much I, on your browsing look, patterns. I, I was one of these people once upon a time that had all JavaScript and all cookies blocked, and I, yeah. As time went on, I've just gradually given up. Yeah. I'm very. Yeah. It's, it's I'm really sorry to say that, but they're very. It's very definitely dependent on your browsing habits and the sites that you're regularly going to, for yeah. sure. My question is: Do you mind if I ask a non-question quickly <laughs> um, about the OAuth? Um, sign-ins, like log in with your Facebook account, log in with your Google account. Maybe you have something to add to that because those are actually a privacy nightmare. Yep. <clears throat> I won't say much because it could be a huge amount to be said, but um, when I said about, uh, you know, the log in with Facebook button that, or the stuff they can gather, what you're giving, you're telling them what your Facebook account is so that they can then go gather everything. Um, so you're actually... The other, pr oh, there's lots of problems with them actually. I actually meant the other way around. Facebook, in order to let you use that, oh. is going to demand from you. So for instance, Airbnb, if you log in there, Airbnb is committed to um, yep. giving verified information to Facebook, which is even worse. Yep, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's even worse. I'm not quite as far in that, because everyone that has add this on the website if you've logged into Facebook and you've got the Facebook cookie, or it's not just add this, if anyone has got the proper Facebook-like stuff as recommended by Facebook, Facebook are also tracking where you've been. 
But yes, knowing when you've logged on and that, so Facebook is gathering even more if you do that. I might just say another little thing I have, I might be the only one that feels this way. I don't like using those login with Facebook, login with Google, because I always figure, well, if somehow someone manages to compromise my Google account or my Facebook account, they're suddenly into everything. Am I the only one that feels that way? Oh, good. Phew. <laughs> All right, sorry. Um, I was just going to point out as well, there is um, a long storied history of uh, people developing ad blocking software and stuff, and then later on allowing people to pay to bypass their um, blacklists. So they'll whitelist yep. advertisers that pay them. Yep, thank you. That's actually a good one to give people warning about. Um, there are blockers, browsers, etc., that say they're private and they look good, except what they're doing is replacing Google's ads with someone else's ads that they're getting a cut of. So, you know, just read the fine print before you settle on whatever you're going to settle on. A couple of quick questions. Um, one is, what is your thoughts on the, the Tor project, Tor, the anonymizer? And the second one is, um, doesn't uh, some of the later re releases of Firefox address some of this tracking, or try to attempt to? Thank yep. Um, I'm not up with the details of how well Tor works for this. So I can't give you a good answer for that. Uh, my understanding is the primary thing, and someone else here can correct me if I'm wrong, the primary thing Tor will do is hide your IP address. To my knowledge, it's not going to stop this information actually being gathered. I'm seeing a couple of nods in the audience, so I think maybe I am right about that. Um, the browsers based on Firefox that are supposed to be private, read the fine print. You might find not all of them are as private as they claim to be in the headings. But, ch but check. I'm not saying they're all like that. We are at uh, 5.25 currently. Um, are you happy to take another the last question? Yep. Yeah, yeah one uh, more. In the interest then. of fairness, I suppose we should move it to this. I'll be, I'll be at the, um, the networking session tonight. I'll be around tomorrow, so if you want to just grab me. Yep. Have you ever seen the case of using a different email address for everything you sign up for by using email wildcard so you can reuse your domain, but any email going to that domain will go to some inbox? The email address will help a bit for you knowing when you get spammed to that email address, you know who sold your email address. But it's not really going to help with this because they're not using your email address as a key. Um, it might fool them slightly and they might take a bit longer to work out that that email address and that email address are the same person. But unless you're doing other stuff as well, they're going to work that out and they're going to say, oh, you've got a dozen email addresses and they'll work it out eventually just because of what they're gathering. They're just gathering so much. And you saw the few companies I looked at, and you remember that big long list that it was originally from news.com.au? There are more than that. They are all sharing the data. They're each collecting their bit and then they're sharing it amongst themselves and them, either themselves or using something like ID5 to work out you are you. So, sorry. <laughs> On that cheery note, we might have to wrap this up. <laughs> I, uh, after Donna's talk, I've tried to work out how I can make the, end this in a cheerier note. I couldn't think of it. Thank you very much for your presentation this afternoon, for scaring the hell out of us. And, uh, <laughs> uh, on behalf of Linux Conf AU, um, small token of our appreciation, uh, please a round of applause for. Thank you. Thank you.